Welcome to the fourth installment of the NZCE 2020 webinar series. Today we will be covering the broad topic of horizontal and distributed infrastructure, an important aspect of earthquake engineering that sometimes does not get the exposure that it deserves. This webinar has been organised by Matt Fox from Becker, and I'd like to thank him for the significant effort that he has put into, into the organisation for today. I'd also like to thank Liam Wotherspoon and Brava for agreeing to act as co-chairs for the webinar today. There are another two webinars remaining in the series, two weeks apart, scheduled for June 25th and July 9th. The June 25th webinar will be the NZDCE EQC webinar on low damage seismic design. We have three speakers currently lined up for this one. The first is David Ma of Ma Structural Design in Berkeley, California, who will deliver the EQC keynote presentation covering some recent projects that have implemented high performance design approaches that go beyond the code minimum within the San Francisco Bay Area. We will also then have Alistair Kadnak and Rowan Bala from Dunning Thornton covering three recent, three recent base isolation projects they have designed in Wellington, covering the lessons that they've learned, including the interactions with the NZDCE base isolation guidelines. The July 9th webinar will cover the earthquake insurance lessons for earth, will cover earthquake insurance lessons for engineers, and further details on the speakers will be released in the near future. We hope you can join us for these remaining webinars in the series. I would like to again extend another huge thank you to EQC, who are partnering with EQC to deliver this webinar series. I would also like to extend their thanks to our major sponsor, MB's Building System Performance, as well as to Taylor Devices, Geostabilization International, Mainmark, Granol Rubber and Engineering, and QuakeCore for their support of the webinar series. We are very near to finalising the published proceedings of papers for the 2020 conference. We have received over 70 revised papers from authors who still wish to have their papers published. We're working on final copy editing and indexing, and we'll release the full proceedings in the next couple of weeks. A reminder that during the webinar today, we will be using Pigeonhole to manage the questions that arise. This is a separate system to Adobe Connect that's hosting the webinar, and can be opened in a browser, on your computer, or on a smartphone. Even if you don't have a question, you can vote for questions that are asked by others. So it's well worth uh, logging on and doing that. So the address for that is just below my, my um, image and video just here. That's about it for me regarding formalities. I'll now pass over to Liam and Brava, who will co-chair this webinar today. Great. Thanks for that, Jeff. Yes, yeah, so I am uh, Liam Wallace-Spoon here from Civil Environmental Engineering Department uh, at the University of Auckland, and um, my co-chair, Brava, you can uh, see above me. So I'm just going to introduce uh, the presenters today. So we've got three presentations today. Uh, the first one is from uh, Dr. Conrad Zorn, who's a lecturer at the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Auckland. Uh, he's been in this position uh, since the end of last year, and that's following uh, a stint over uh, at the University of Oxford, so he's come back uh, to New Zealand, which is great to see. So he's going to give the first presentation, which is going to talk about multi-scale infrastructure analytics for seismic risk assessment. Um, the second presenter is uh, Dr. Kaylee crawford Flat, who's an industry-funded geotechnical researcher currently based uh, at the University of Canterbury with the Quake Centre. Uh, and she uh, also serves on the New Zealand Society of Large Dams Management Committee, representing the members at large across New Zealand. Uh, she's going to present on Aotearoa embankment infrastructure, understanding and safeguarding our dams and stockbanks. Uh, the last presenter is uh, David Rowland, or Rowley, who's the Southern Geotechnical Market Lead at Becker, based in Christchurch. He's been with Becker for the last nine years, and during that time has been heavily involved in both Nectar and Skirt. Uh, so the last pre his presentation is going to be on the Nectar story, moving mountains to reconnect communities. So, so as um, Jeff said, uh, as you're going through, we're going to collect those questions. Uh, the presenters are going to go through and give their presentations one by one, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Conrad to kick off his presentation. All right. Uh, thanks, Liam. So my name is Conrad Zorn, as uh, Liam introduced, I'm with the University of Auckland. This is my first involvement with the NZDC, so thanks to, to Jeff and Matt and the conference committee uh, for the invite today to talk about uh, multi-scale infrastructure analytics and looking through a bit of a, a seismic lens uh, today. 
by infrastructure here, we're meaning horizontal infrastructure or distributed infrastructure. So your, uh, your roads, your rail, uh, your electricity and the dependent networks. They use those, for example, fuel supply or uh, solid waste. You may be familiar with the picture on the right there. This is from the, the Northridge earthquake, um, where it's a, uh, a single component in this image. For example, a power line, say, has probably had to deal with some seismic shaking, maybe some ground deformation, uh, fire breaking out there, and, uh, and the streets flooded. So there's a lot more going on here rather than just purely uh, seismic risk, but we're not talking uh, today just about these assets. What we're going to do is take a, a higher level approach, still data driven, but more of a, a top down view. Um, so rather than the, the typical engineering looking purely at the, the fragility of components, we'll take a, a much wider picture. All right. So you probably don't need to be um, convinced of why uh, this type of work is important if you're in this call. But globally, we are spending trillions and trillions on infrastructure. Depending on who you ask, it's always around the, the three to four trillion, say, per year. Whether it's enough or not uh, is a different presentation entirely. Protecting this infrastructure, though, locally, uh, we're motivated by safety, by different laws and acts and building codes. Internationally, um, particularly developing countries, don't have this same uh, background and we have all these different uh, global agreements. You may be familiar with things like Sendai, like Paris, Sustainable Development Goals. And all of your work that you do day to day on infrastructure is all uh, directly relevant to, to these global agreements. Particularly when you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, um, infrastructure directly impacts all of those and 72% of the targets that are nested within these goals. So not obviously uh, always positive effect, a coal power plant, for example, uh, can have positive and negative effects. Same with the greenfield uh, destruction or the greenfield construction, say, or a road, or if you're urbanising in, in a highly hazardous uh, area. And so neglecting a lot of these things, um, whether you're doing it consciously or not, um, can have a, a setback on, on human development uh, around the world. So overall, it does make sense for us to focus on infrastructure resilience, uh, particularly now when we're seeing uh, about $4 benefit or $4 worth of avoided losses um, over the last span of an asset for every additional dollar that we spend on resilience. So while it might increase the uh, capital cost originally, the, uh, the overall benefits uh, are seen down the track. Staying at the kind of global lens, quickly just looking at a study here uh, that we've done last year. We looked at every single road, every single piece of rail, and uh, every bridge uh, across the world in the transport network, and looking at the expected annual damages. So these pictures on the right here, on the far left, this is the absolute damages in terms of billion US dollars. And this is to not just earthquakes here, we're also bringing in uh, coastal flooding, fluvial, fluvial flooding, and cyclone cleanups as well. So the absolute damages, uh, New Zealand's ranking quite highly. Yep, we are a small country, we have a lot of exposure. We're about 42nd rated in the world uh, here in terms of transport damage per year. When we turn it in terms of expected GDP losses, um, we're about mid-pack. The key transition here that you'll notice from the left to the right, the left hand side there, we've got lots of darker boxes. So there's the higher income countries and upper middle income countries. Whereas on the right hand side, these are a lot more of the low income countries. So these are the countries that um, are disproportionately affected from the same uh, hazard. And using this, we look to target areas where we can reduce uh, the risk to flooding to uh, seismic activity. So, in the top right there, the deeper shades of purple is where the greatest relative reduction in risks are. If you squint closely, you can probably see in New Zealand not too many dark areas um, relative to the rest of the world. A lot of these are in these more, uh, more developing countries. And something else hasn't come through here on the slide, but we'll um, continue anyway. So this is the global picture, but what about New Zealand? So globally, right, we're quite low or quite low down in these rankings. Um, this doesn't happen by fluke, right? It's a lot of hard work over the years. 
Um, but with all this comes additional responsibility now because a lot of these lower income countries on the right hand side there are all relying on the insights uh, and advice from uh, countries like New Zealand who have a relatively closed system but also uh, highly exposed. So lots of frequent events so we can best inform this. Typically in New Zealand, apologies this is a bit of a loaded slide, um, we'll focus on the, the first row first where it says component models. So typically New Zealand's focused uh, on component models, so fragility models of, of single assets um, and studying those in great detail. Why we do this is because we're really good at it. We have lots of data, uh, lots of monitoring and strong stakeholder support. So much more stakeholder support in New Zealand uh, than most of the world. And New Zealand's also relatively um, adopting of, of new technology and in retrofit solutions and bits and pieces like that. So what we're doing now is accelerating more into say the, the integrated network modeling, modeling side. So we're not just looking at individual components, but we're also looking more um, beyond the exposure and into, into the so what. So if this asset is damaged, what does it actually mean for the wider network? What does it mean for other networks? What does it mean, uh, how does this reflect on the rest of the country and, and the economic performance, for example? And so integrating all these different kinds of infrastructure networks is not necessarily a trivial task. Uh, if it was, we would have fully operational uh, digital twins of our cities, of our country, even the world. Um, and so this is even hard enough to do for things like the space stations or oil rigs or, uh, or airplanes where they have um, a bit more drive to do it, but they have much more um, control over um, their assets there and what they're, what they're representing. If anyone uh, has modelled a transport network or a water distribution network or something like that for a town or a city, uh, you know how um, difficult that is in terms of the calibration and validation of that. So when you start scaling this up into wider regions, uh, into the country, the global scale and, and interacting between infrastructure networks as well, um, it just soon becomes a, a massive problem. So generally the main, the main takeaway from the slide, on the left we've got huge amounts of input data feeding into network modelling and then finally into analytics. If you want to dig a bit deeper into it, you're not just looking at physical damage but also the flow along networks, so whether it's the power flow, whether it's hydraulic uh, whether it's the hydraulics of the network and so on, and also the interdependencies. So these are the interactions between uh, the networks. If you think of a petrol station, for example, which we also model, these require electricity, they require some water, um, they also require that their oil tankers um, can be connected. So they need road networks and they need a bulk supply point which is accessible more often they might have to use multiple box supply points from different uh, different ports and these are all uh, again depending on electricity, depending on water and so on and so forth. So it's a big, uh, a big integrated network and failures can cascade these, these pretty quickly if they're not, uh, not constrained. Huge amounts of data, um, spatial data, operational data, interdependency data, capacities, redundancies and so on and so forth. So feeding these all together, creating a, a national model, now then we move more into the recovery phases. So there's lots of different recovery models out there in the, in the literature. Uh, very few of these, in fact, are actually informed by empirical events like we do have in New Zealand. And we've got uh, a number of uh, big recovery events that uh, Rowley will be talking about later. And they don't necessarily consider all the, the complex uh, situations that we have in recovery. So there's a myriad of social, political, economic uh, factors uh, in recovery. It's not purely just uh, getting infrastructure back on uh, per se, and there's also ongoing disruptions, aftershocks and things that are often not well represented in these, in these recovery models. So this kind of idea, this framework here plan requires strong stakeholder support, which New Zealand are really good at, lots of network specific, uh, specific experts, and, and not just universities and CRIs. So there's people all over New Zealand and all over the world that are actually feeding into all these different boxes for our, our New Zealand models uh, now. So, we're not just talking about it, and we're actually doing stuff as well. Our first iteration of our independent uh, New Zealand network model uses all sorts of data. Here's a, here's a snapshot of some of the infrastructure network data, um, spatial 
networks of them. So we use all these weird and wonderful infrastructures with thousands of nodes and edges, and we model the, uh, the flows and capacities and, and the effects of all of these. And so while they're, um, their networks themselves um, are hierarchical, so in the bottom right here, we've got a, a representation of a um, electricity network. Where you see at the top level, we've got generators. These feed into the transmission network, which trickle down into the distribution network, and so on and so forth, until you get down to your, uh, your end user. So theoretically, a disruption can happen at the top in a generator, and this can have cascading failures both across the network and, and within and up and down, and then to other networks as well. Uh, some initial outputs uh, from this. If we focus more on the right hand side in the interest of time here, uh, this figure is showing a map of New Zealand, and there are little hexagons. Yeah, the colour of the hexagon uh, implies the disruptive risk. So, for this example, we can um, just relate this to the population, for example. It would be impacted. And then we have uh, the size of the hexagon being the disruptive reach. So what's the spatial extent of these disruptions? How far does it extend? Might be hard for you to see on your screen. Uh, one of the more obvious things you can see though here uh, in this resolution is the big uh, blue corridor up north of Auckland leading from Auckland up to Northland. Um, so this is a somewhat obvious one where we have the main state highway one, uh, we have Transpower, or national grid lines um, feeding up to Northland, and also a, uh, a fuel pipeline, uh, which was discovered a couple of years ago by a digger, and the great effect that has on, uh, on the country. So that's why here you see deep dark blue, disruptive risk, and these are big hexagons as well, because they have a huge spatial reach. Lots of other um, fun things you can talk about across the country, There's, like you can see in the Hawke's Bay there, there's a link going into Gisborne area, an important one, similarly into Wellington with the zoom in there, and into the, uh, the west coast, a number of uh, lines there. While we're on the west coast narrative, some of you may be familiar with the AF8 project. Um, it's been running for a few years. If you're not, there's the website af8.org.nz, or you might see them on their uh, social media campaign at the moment. Uh, lots of interesting resources there. They're focusing on an alpine fault scenario. Um, the idea is for the collaboration here is to inform our uh, recovery models. And so this requires huge stakeholder engagement, uh, which a number of you would have been involved in in various workshops across the country. I personally uh, wasn't there, but a, a colleague, Alistair Davies, who was with the University of Canterbury, but now with uh, MCDEM or NEMA, as it's now called, um, collated a lot of this information from all these workshops, uh, testing these what-if scenarios with the local experts, so the local infrastructure owners and operators. And so the idea is, if this infrastructure asset was damaged, um, what, what would you do? So they can help guide us uh, in terms of recovery paths and, and what their priorities are um, over time and when they, when they make interventions and uh, key decisions. So the pictures here just showing on the left these are all our infrastructure networks across you know, water, rail, uh, telecommunications, and so on and so forth. Uh, the red lines being the uh, fault lines across the country, and a, and a shaking map on the right. Given that there's uh, so much variability in an alpine fault earthquake, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Brendan Bradley's group or the Quake Core group. They're looking at uh, ground motion simulations. So here is just three snapshots along the top here, a north to south scenario, a central scenario, and a south to north scenario they're called, depending on where the epicenter is. And these show the uh, shaking intensity. There's MMI here, as it's a bit more of a, uh, an accessible metric um, for the public or, uh, or relevant parties. Um, but in doing so, we can see simple things like the exposed population, how much that changes depending on where this epicenter is. 100,000 in that north to south scenario, moving up more and more, so it's up to 360,000 uh, above a, a shaking intensity of level seven. So 3.6 times more people, um, depending on where this is. So we've got a huge range of different uh, situations to plan for here. Population is quite an easy one when we start looking at the infrastructure networks themselves. 
uh, at the bottom here, these are some uh, petroleum fuel distribution networks. Um, so the bigger squares are the bulk supply points, like you'll see at your ports, and the smaller dots are all the petrol stations across across the country. And these are all connected by road and, and modelled by um, trucks um, delivering to them. The idea is that uh, that we're trying to get across here is for the shaking scenarios, the little left ones with the uh, the browny orange colours. Um, the shaking extent where we move. When we actually look at the disruption extent, these are the big red ones, uh, it expands a much larger area. Disruption here, we're not talking about the uh, the tanks aren't getting floated out of the ground or the, uh, the service stations not collapsing, but these are disruptions from normal services. So, um, so the infrastructure users in these areas, more dependent on these petrol stations, may see a reduction in, in, their, normal, uh, in their normal service. So while we typically run lots of different scenarios, so both in terms of the hazard and in terms of the fragility of assets and different network assumptions and recovery assumptions. Um, here we just pulled one out. Uh, the top left here uh, is usually a GIF cycling through showing the, uh, the recovery over time. Um, but you might have to imagine that for now with the extent of recovery getting smaller and smaller. The darker shade has been the darker, deeper reds and oranges being the, the number of uh, infrastructures that are potentially disrupted from their normal service. So not destruction, but uh, a reduced level of service. Something you might be more familiar with in the bottom left, uh, this is showing one snapshot of a recovery scenario. Uh, along the bottom, we have the uh, x-axis there with the time and days, uh, the y-axis there showing the functionality of the networks over time. And here we see uh, the importance of, of having electricity networks for all these other infrastructures. So the road network and the electricity network here are driving a lot of, of this recovery in this particular situation. Um, so while this is all fun and games, uh, here are some, some big questions uh, we can ask. In the top right here for the fuel supply network, here we're looking at the difference between direct disruptions and indirect disruptions. So direct disruptions being ones that you have probably possibly a bit more control over. So this is like the strengthening of your own assets and your own network. So you can strengthen uh, that as much as you like, but if you're dependent on others, then you're going to get uh, indirect disruptions. So if there's a power cut, then you're indirectly disrupted. Same as if a road network is out or a bulk supply point is out, uh, an issue with the coastal shipping, a water network and so on and so forth. So these are indirect, indirect disruptions. So there's, a, there's a, a toss up here, not just in New Zealand, but all around the world, in terms of what do you strengthen? Um, here, would you protect your, your own assets? Or uh, when do you start introducing redundancies? So having a, a generator on site, um, having a, uh, a multimodal shift in terms of your supply chain, where you can go from, for example, a fuel supply from a pipeline onto a truck, bits and pieces like that, uh, or water storage or more storage capacity at your at your own site. So these are some of the uh, the pressing questions that uh, that we're moving through here. Now, final slide for you. Some of the uh, the ongoing challenges. So maintenance over a resilience building is a uh, a topic uh, generating a lot of discussion. While we can build these fancy assets, um, resilient as we like, if we're not maintaining them to a certain level, uh, what's the point? All of a sudden they're, um, they're not as resilient uh, as the original thought, so we can't use the same fragilities and, and vulnerability functions anymore. Uh, we see lots in the USA about this, if you're looking, following along ASCE stuff, or even uh, Hillary Clinton last election cycle campaigned a lot on the state of the US infrastructure. There's the question here about robustness versus redundancies. Um, here, not so much of trouble, uh, but uh, in developing countries, for example, you, you have to weigh up the idea between giving, um, building a, a small area of your network really robust or with redundancies and, and nice and strong, or going the opposite way and rolling out accessibility with a with a more likely um, likelihood of being disrupted. In terms of the, the model development and integration side of things, um, validation is always the, the key problem here. So national network models, um, global models, are hard to, to validate. 
at once. So we have to upscale these to different areas, downscale them to different regions, um, and, and move across scale to different countries to, to be able to best inform and, and validate uh, our assumptions across these. In doing so though, we have lots more New Zealand models uh, being developed, like national scale or large scale infrastructure network models all the time. So the South Island transport model has been um, developed recently over the last few years. Uh, there's plenty of work in terms of water distribution networks that have been done uh, following the Canterbury event that is ready to be integrated into all sorts of uh, areas. Same with economic tools that you may be familiar with, uh, Merit for example, which can model the, uh, the economic recovery uh, after an infrastructure outage. With all these models comes lots more data, spatial and temporal, um, and the idea is that we can start planning more in terms of our new investments, and what that means for our network, not just our local networks, but the wider country in terms of resilience of these networks, and the ongoing initiatives regarding data management uh, and asset management across the country, and integrating these different uh, disruptive technologies going into the future electric cars being uh, an obvious one here. Uh, so some of the work we're doing, and you'll see over the next few years, supported through Quake Core and the National Science Challenges, is a lot of drive in the Wellington region. Um, some pictures here just of a, uh, a little study we did initially based on Wellington region and just seeing the spatial extent, um, how much further uh, a disruption of, a, of an area of assets can have on the, on the wider country across uh, across the wider region, sorry, uh, in terms of um, both the spatial extent and, and the number of people who are affected here. So that brings uh, that to conclusion. Um, add any questions to the chat, otherwise um, you can contact me via the, the usual ways and also now it's time to pass over to Kaylee. Great, thank you Conrad. And kia ora everyone, um, I am Kaylee, and I will be speaking to you today about Aotearoa's embankment infrastructure, both dams and stop banks. I tend to go one way or the other, far too few slides or far too many. Today is a far too many day. Um, it's a bit of an interesting audience for me, I'm not usually uh, presenting to the NZDCE uh, audience. So the intent is to give you a bit of an overview. If you'd like to know more, please do get in touch. So my background, I'm a Kiwi. I grew up in Hastings, did an undergraduate at the University of Canterbury. Um, I then worked for Riley Consultants as a consultant dam engineer for a wee while after graduation, um, obviously during my undergraduate, and then took off to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver to do my PhD um, with support from the IPN Hume Fellowship and also British Columbia Hydro. So my PhD was a academic industry partnership um, between British Columbia Hydro and UBC in Vancouver. I finished it up and did some contracting work for Hydro um, on one of their 200 metre high earth dams and eventually made my way back to New Zealand um, and have done a mix of industry and academia work since. So today, a quick introduction context. I'm going to skip over item number two, criticality of embankments in New Zealand. Um, if you want to know more about any of the inventory or national perspective work, please do get in touch with me. Um, the main intent here is to give you an appreciation of the societal function and the critical nature and the absolute proliferation of embankments in New Zealand. People seem to be extremely surprised when they hear about that. Um, the main show and tell today is really around um, research and geotechnical vulnerabilities and what we're doing to try and address New Zealand's specific challenges around embankment resiliency. So, introduction. Um, I spent about six years in Canada um, and a few years in New Zealand prior looking at performance of earth dams um, in a geotechnical sense, looking at particle migra migration, filter design, material susceptibility, um, the terrible word piping, I have a real issue with the word piping, so uh, internal erosion in general, so particle migration in various forms, micro scale, macro scale, 
the interaction between material susceptibility, i.e. the gradation um, and density, uh, things like that, with stress conditions and hydraulic load to trigger different mechanisms of internal erosion, such as fines migration, suffusion, suppression, piping, boiling, heave, hydraulic fracture, etc. So having spent a bit of time immersed in, in Canadian dam infrastructure, I came back to New Zealand um, and consulted a wee bit, um, mainly working in dam safety, and then with the um, inception of the Quake Centre Earth Structures Research Project, uh, I initially put half a foot in that camp and um, worked half time as a consultant, the other half time as a researcher, and eventually with the support of Trust Power, Mercury, Meridian, Genesis, and Peter Amos from Damwatch, we collectively um, set up the Earth Structures Research Project, which began, I think, formally at the beginning of 2015. So we're now about five years in. And I led that project with help from uh, the University of Canterbury Civil and Natural Resource Engineering Department, along with geology, geography, um, other external linkages, and most importantly, the support from the hydropower companies and the project steering committee. Um, today, I will also be talking to you about stop banks and levees, and we can thank uh, Liam Wotherspoon at the University of Auckland for um, expanding horizons in that area, uh, and that, is, that work's been mainly supported by the National Science Challenge, um, along with the regional talent and unitary authorities. The main thrust of the DAMS project um, will be seismic in the long term. However, we have a lot of work to do to understand uh, governing factors in static conditions as it is. So the, the main structure of the, um, of the Earth Dam research project is. I don't think my pointer is going to work. Um, we have filter and transmission zones. We are looking at micro scale modelling of the way soils erode um, in combination with macro scale damage and internal deformation, um, linking into 2.3 multi earthquake responses damaged assets. So, looking not only at an earthquake aftershock sequence, but also the cumulative impact of seismic activity over a dam's life. Um, at the core of all of this initially was a deep study trying to quantify um, our infrastructure and learn about input parameters for future modelling. So that was that was the starting point for um, for the program. Today I'll be mostly talking about the microscale erosion modelling and element testing. Um, what we initially did was look at national inventories for our verification of our research focus. Um, if we're going to look at the combined influence of materials, hydraulic loading, and stress condition, we need to understand these things. So our material susceptibility is mainly a function of design standard and geology. Um, by creating a national inventory, we gain a perspective around locations of our structures, therefore geology, along with our construction um, practice at the time of design. Hydraulic loading um, is important, and we learn a lot about embankment um, loading through the height of the dam. Um, as opposed to Canada, where many of the dams are 200 metres plus, New Zealand tends to have slightly smaller structures. And similarly, with stress conditions, um, embankment height and overburden compaction conditions are really important. So by putting together national inventories of dams and stop banks, we learn about these things, and we learn about the criticality of structures and where we should be investing our effort. So embankments in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, initially we put together an inventory of dams in New Zealand simply to verify a research proposition. Over the years, central government got in touch to augment this inventory and we've worked with councils um, to create an inventory of 3,300 dams. Um, <laughs> The next project was with uh, Resilience to Nature's Challenges, looking at stop banks, and with the help of Dr. Daniel Blake and Eduardo Pascal, we worked with councils to assemble a national inventory of stop banks, and there'll be a paper forthcoming on that shortly, I hope. What the inventory was used for, um, initially I was contacted by MB around um, providing input to a proposed regulatory dam safety scheme. 
and from 2015 to present, I've been involved in the uh, technical working group for that proposed regulatory data safety scheme, which has not yet uh, crossed the line. But the inventory has been really helpful in determining thresholds for inclusion in a dam safety scheme, along with um, who will be affected, residual risk and compliance costs. Uh, Conrad showed uh, some of the national maps that Quake Corps have been putting out, Dr. Brendan Bradley's group. And um, as you can see from the, the very active map on the left, if we overlay active faults with our dams and salt banks, we have a very, very busy map of things going on. So Daniel Blake um, has looked at national maps for liquefaction, landslide and ground motion exposure. And that will be coming out soon. What do we know about our dams? Well, we have over 3,300 dams in New Zealand. Over 90% of them are earth fill dams. Over half of them are for agricultural, pastoral, irrigation purposes, but we also have flood protection, hydroelectric, water supply and recreation amenity dams that serve a critical function for every one of us. In addition, we have over 5,000 kilometres of flood protection salt banks. So, we all actually rely on dams more than we probably realise. Um, we have over 125 hydroelectric dams providing over half of New Zealand's electricity. So every time we switch on a light, we are relying on those dams to serve a purpose. Most of Auckland um, and much of Wellington for much of the year rely on dams to secure their water supply. Most of our veggies, fruit, meat, wine and milk um, all rely on dams in some way, shape or form to provide us with uh, and then little known flood protection dams. We have a great number of flood protection dams in New Zealand and in fact over 500 dams protecting urban Auckland. Interestingly many of them are not often holding water so they're often dry ponds around your parks um, in your reserves and specifically built to attenuate flood flow during events. On the flood protection Note, we have the 5,000 kilometres of stop banks and levees. Um, here we are looking at the EDGECAM event um, in 2018. So it's not actually just dam safety, it's a matter of securing your power, food um, and flood protection. Um, one thing that the inventory has shown here is that our dams are actually quite old. Um, in general, if we look at medium and high potential impact dams, most were built prior to the mid 1980s and like all engineering standards, dam safety engineering standards have improved over time. So we're particularly interested in how compliant uh, these dams are with respect to modern design criteria and standards and guidelines. In addition to this kind of aging dam population problem, which is one that is not unique to New Zealand, we do have a number of challenges to understanding our embankments that are a little bit more unique to New Zealand. Um, specifically, New Zealand has highly variable geology, um, including many very widely graded soils, so glacial materials, a lot of uh, river gravels, including finer materials. Uh, volcanics are another big question mark around whether published methods apply to volcanically derived soils. In addition, uh, when it comes to stress conditions, the set of practice criteria for internal instability and filter compatibility do not specifically address seismic conditions. We don't know how well they actually apply. Another kind of high level challenge is the decentralized stewardship and knowledge in both the dam and stop bank space since the 1980s with the um, fragmentation of the river of the catchment board and with the uh, privatisation of our hydropower assets. The general understanding up until now has been this idea that we can kind of design a dam now, we think, um, to ensure it doesn't erode. We do that primarily through material susceptibility, um, addressing that component. So on the right, we're looking at this interaction between material susceptibility hydraulic load and a critical stress condition. If we design our material correctly, um, so if we look at particle size, if we look at uniformity, if we look at limiting segregation, we can typically now design a dam if we spend enough money to resist erosion. On the other end of the spectrum, on your left, um, the problem of continuing erosion where essentially it's 
akin to throwing a handful of marbles into a pool of basketballs. Um, the, the experience of continuing erosion is that actually we probably don't have that many structures that are that susceptible to internal erosion because they probably wouldn't remain here. So we're kind of in this middle ground where the material susceptibility does not meet modern design criteria, but the dams are still there and there may or may not be evidence of progressive erosion um, for these dams that are aging now and don't meet modern design criteria. So the question then becomes, with questionable material susceptibility, what is that relationship between hydraulic load and stress condition and material susceptibility that may cause a problem for our, for our aging embankments? So how do we manage our dams that don't meet modern design criteria for particle migration? In a general sense, looking at geotechnical vulnerabilities, we're asking two main questions, and here we're kind of looking at a canal with a liner and a subgrade, and asking, can a soil retain its own small particles? And then secondly, can particles migrate between soil units? Particularly with um, seepage flows that may or may not be significant, and then the earthquake shaking. The first question, can a soil retain its own small particles? We here are looking at internal stability. And you see there in the figure, um, that is a typical canal embankment soil that we have put in the lab. Typically, susceptibility to internal instability is assessed using gradation. So empiricism moves on to a lab, test your materials, publish data, and said, look, you want to avoid these certain combinations of particle sizes. But there are huge limitations in that approach in that there is a limited database of testing. We don't know if New Zealand soils actually, um, if these methods are applicable to New Zealand soils. And again, we don't know, um, when we're in that grey zone of not meeting modern design criteria, how stress, hydraulic and seismic factors may influence susceptibility to internal instability. It's not just dam fill, it's foundations, it's the riverbeds, it's salt banks that are top, it's your dam fill, it's your foundation. It's a lot of different materials, both fill, or engineered and natural. The way we are proposing to address this is through a large novel dynamic triate field permeometer. Um, this device was about two years in the um, design and development process, went through peer review, um, funded mainly by the hydropower companies, um, so Genesis, Merc Mercury, Meridian and Trustpower. Um, and this is the first device in the world that can apply seismic load with uh, seepage capability as well. So we can essentially put together a giant triaxial specimen, um, determining what materials we put in there through gradation manipulation. Um, because it's so big, we can fit in the real widely graded dam materials. We can quantify stress um, and measure it. We can apply static and dynamic stress states to the material, and then we can impose seepage in a downward flow uh, configuration with capacity to measure particle migration in the device. This is a huge undertaking, and currently we have Catherine Yates, who is now full-time on the commissioning and verification of the device, and we are hoping to publish the um, kind of initial work on that toward the end of the year. Um, and that is the bulk, really, of the upcoming Quakes of the Dam project. In the meantime, we are investing quite a bit of effort in looking at filter compatibility, that is, can particle migration be prevented at a soil interface? Again, susceptibility is typically assessed using empiricism, looking at soil gradation um, particle size. And again, we don't have a very good understanding of the stress, hydraulic, and seismic conditions that may contribute to um, migration of particles in a downward flow configuration in this image here from the finer material into a coarser material. Um, again, filter compatibility, you probably would have heard about this in undergraduate, I would hope, but it's not just about filters, it's actually about any kind of soil interface. So it may be your stop bank sitting on a riverbed, it may be dam fill on a foundation, it may be dam fill against another, another dam fill in various orientations. Um, so what we've been doing at the University of Canterbury is looking at something called a continuing erosion filter test, which is a particularly unrefined test, mainly observational, where we put a compacted core material atop a, um, a simulated filter or a coarser material, 
with uh, the conversion gravels above and below the cell and flow water in a downward configuration, capturing the particles and flow that uh, come through the cell. We can test a limited range of soils. We can't throw any really large particles into that 240 millimetre device. The stress states are unknown. We compact at optimum moisture content to hope for the best. Um, and again, seepage in a downward flow configuration is not that well quantified or controlled. So it's a fairly limited test. And Foster and Fell in 1999 first put this test together, and it's pretty much what state of practice dam engineers use to assess filter compatibility. Um, initially, there was an idea that erosion of filters um, or at a filter interface was linear. We have initiation, initiation, continuation, progression leading to breach, uh, which seems awfully idealist, <laughs> idealistic. Um, in 2014, Rodney Bridal was kind of published an update saying, hang on a minute, we may have filtration and a risk of erosion before it gets to the breach mechanism. However, this is still a rather simplistic either continuation or um, essentially plugging or clogging or bridging of that filter interface to stop particles eroding. What we actually realise we have here is either, it's not an either or, the, on the right that's that scenario of filtration where the filter seals, the particles are arrested and nothing more happens. On the left that continuing erosion leading to breach. Um, this current state of practice at the bottom of the screen here the way this has typically been assessed is looking at how much mass erodes in the lab over a 30 minute test and so you're measuring the, the total mass lost, the total number of mass of particles washed out and then saying that if it's less than 10 grams, no erosion. If it's more than 100 grams, the filter doesn't seal and you've got continuing erosion. And then somewhere in between that, you're kind of in trouble but you don't quite know how bad things are. And again, we are very much interested in that some two inches of erosion area looking at particle migration for dams that do not meet modern design criteria. Um, we are seeing increasingly in the field and in the lab that internal erosion, particularly with the filter interface, is not linear. Um, there's been a number of reports and observations in my testing and others around metastability. Uh, Tekapo Canal here in New Zealand was one where Benson in 2011 talked about um, metastable uh, stable and unstable cyclic behaviour uh, over periods of weeks to years to decades. Um, he notes that understanding of the metastable internal erosion behaviour is a prerequisite to assist dam safety conditions. And then more recently in 2018, um, Foster, Ronquist and Fowl refer to a metastable condition in filter testing in the lab, talking about erosion that can reoccur as new pathways break out into the adjoining unsealed portions of that interface. So it's all very kind of hand wavy at the moment. Um, in order to get a better grasp on what's going on here, we have modified our continuing erosion filter cell um, rather than just simply taking the total mass eroded over a 30 minute test, the University of Canterbury continuing erosion filter test cell, uh, we're now measuring mass loss total and over time, as well as the seepage flow by putting a flow meter in series and then the upper cell inflow pressure giving us a time series of pressure in the top of the cell. This test is just done connected to main supply, again particularly unsophisticated, um, but plenty of room to improve our understanding. So what we end up looking at, I've got three scenarios here. Um, scenario one is essentially a no erosion filter, where the filter is a fine filter, it arrests any migration of particles in a downward seepage flow configuration. After the initial filling, um, in the green series, you can see the, the rise and flow. Um, there is zero flow for the duration of the 30 minute test and the water pressure at the top of the cell is completely steady at the maximum main pressure through the um, constriction of the tap at 180 kPa, so nothing happens. You get a few drips of water coming through the apparatus but essentially with no erosion um, the filter seals. Scenario number two, where we have minor mass loss over the 30 minute period, about between kind of five and 10 grams of mass loss. You do get the filter sealing um, with some minor erosion, but you also get a fairly steady state configuration with some flow, in this case kind of between one to two and a half litres per minute. 
and again a fairly steady but ultimately quite stable um, pressure response at the top of the cell. So there's some kind of steady state achieved here. You can see initially at the beginning of the scenario two test we fill the cell, there's an initial out peak outflow um, and then things stabilise as the pressure increases and the filter layer builds. So we can see that in the data. Scenario three is where things get really interesting. Um, with a little bit more mass loss, we get the filter sealing with some erosion according to Foster and Fell and their crude mass loss uh, characterization. But what we actually observe in that pressure and flow data is this um, coupling of pressure and flow as things change. And that's kind of the, um, the sealing and unsealing of that filter interface over time that Ronkvist referred to. So looking in detail at scenario three, again we can see a rise in pressure um, with a drop in flow as the filter seals and then in the red circle a sudden release of pressure and an increase in flow as the seal breaks. Um, and this should be a video, a one minute video, I won't hold you up here. You'll see this three times. Um, <laughs> because I'm never quite sure if people catch this as it happens. So what we're looking at here is particles migrating downwards and sealing against that filter interface in the upper half of the core. And if you look closely, you can see the particles kind of Kind of raining down. Uh, a little bit of, of uh, upward flush of the finer particles as something gives and the pressure um, suddenly changes and things wash out. So again from that 17 minute to 17 and a half minute um, period of the plot that we just had a look at we can see that filter interface building, the pressure increasing, and then the upward flush of finer particles and a pulse of seepage flow washes. And this can go on each and more duration of that 30 minute test. Again, so that it's been down plugging and it evolves up the filter flow. And this is very different to the linear regression that most uh, buildings also believe that we can only <laughs> what is now important to what means more head of uh, the former concern for ongoing. Um, filter performance. So again at Canterbury we're looking in a little bit more detail to try and understand those meta-stable um, scenarios. We've had students try to simulate seismic loading on the device. Uh, not very successful yet but something we're working on for the future. So again rather than just saying we either have no erosion at all when the filter works or we have continuing erosion and the dam falls down, in reality we're looking at many dams that don't meet modern design criteria and trying to understand metastability in terms of material factors, in terms of hydraulic factors and in terms of stress factors. So, summary. Um, understanding Aotearoa, New Zealand embankments. We have put together national inventories and a collective industry structure for the dams project um, and then the council special interest group for the stock banks trying to re-centralise our understanding of flood control and hydropower assets. Um, the intent is that all of this lab work that we're doing is going to be available to um, embankment owners throughout the nation and that we're addressing national priorities and key knowledge gaps throughout the country. In the lab we are putting a lot of effort into trying to understand ageing assets that don't meet modern geotechnical design criteria. Our main thrust going forward will be the state of art triaxial permeometer dynamic um, device uh, that is a heck of a lot of work. So that's underway right now. In the meanwhile, we're trying to probe the observational continuing erosion filter test a little bit more, trying to increase the sophistication and quantification of the data that we can collect to understand spatial and temporal progression of erosion mechanisms. And then in the background we're doing kind of all of the other characterization standard geotechnical tests to look at plasticity, grain size, dispersivity and collapsibility. Ultimately what we're trying to do here is enhance local capabilities with international collaboration 
um, to address these gaps in knowledge and ultimately provide science-based decision support tools for all of industry. So I'm a little bit over. Grateful thanks to the Quake Centre partners who um, fund the industry role, in particular Meridian, Mercury, Genesis and Trust Power who form my steering committee along with Resilience and Nature's Challenges. And with that, um, moving on to David Roland from Becker. Kia ora kato. called David Rowland Toku Ingoa. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about Nectar, uh, which is the North Canterbury Transport Infrastructure Recovery. And I'm going to share a little bit about our story, quite high level, and what resilience looked like for us. Um, but before I start, I want to say thanks to NZSEE for inviting me to, to share the Nectar story, um, and for all the organisers behind the scenes who are feverishly working away there. So. Um, thank you for that. Um, also thanks to Waka Kotahi and Kiwirao and all of the Nectar Whanau, a few of which I've seen are online today. Um, but I also want to thank uh, Te Runanga or Kaikoura and the many communities that, that welcomed the Nectar Whanau and the people of Nectar and, into their beautiful slice of paradise up there on the Kaikoura coast uh, over the last two and a half years. So today I'm going to be talking about resilience in the face of a natural disaster. And for me, and I'm sure many of my Nectar colleagues, um, it's all about the community. Um, the community outcomes have got to be at the heart of any disaster recovery. Um, so I'm going to start with a story. And this is Renee's story. And on the night of the earthquake in, in Kaikoura, Renee had about a dozen international guests staying at her hostel. And this was the hostel that she had just opened two weeks prior, after many months of toil and hard work um, getting it to that point. And as soon as the earthquake struck, uh, Renee had to get her guests out of the hostel in the darkness and up to high ground for fear of tsunami coming in after them. Uh, no one slept that night. Renee, in fact, didn't sleep for 48 hours after the quake happened. Uh, when she got back to her hostel, it was eventually red stickered. That was her home and it was closed for good. Renee then spent the next two weeks couch surfing around friends and family while she tried to get back on her feet. Now some of you on, on this call would have been through similar experiences either in the Christchurch or Kaikoura earthquakes. And you'll know that people uh, facing that catastrophe, the last thing they're thinking about is, is resilience, um, and especially long term resilience. So who really cares about resilience in the face of natural disaster? I'm not going to make you wait until the end for the answer. The answer is we do. Um, the, the recovery organisations and the network operators or owners are the ones that must care about it um, at all points throughout the life cycle. So today, a high level of the Nectar story, I'll first touch on the Kaikoura earthquake and the impact that it had on both the rail and the road corridors. I'll secondly, I'll look at the uh, physical achievements that Nectar did and, and the activities they did over the last two and a half years up in, in, in around Kaikoura. And then finally, I'll, I'll discuss for a bit um, my thoughts on resilience and some of the lessons I've learned from, from Nectar, um, but also Skirt prior to that. Um, and how we as, as design professionals particularly need to be um, thinking about resilience uh, from the beginning all through our design process. Uh, and I guess putting the cards on the table, my, my goal for today is that I want everyone that's on this call to go away from it um, and purposefully consider what resilience means in your current research or your design or whatever it is that you're currently constructing. Um, so if, if we do that, I'll, I'll chalk today's chat up for a win. So the Kaikoura earthquake, um, it was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. It struck two minutes past midnight on the 14th of November 2016. And there was widespread damage throughout the top of the South Island. Uh, the railway line was inoperable and the one million tonnes per year that normally traverses along the main north line was stopped overnight. Uh, that forced a lot of freight onto the road, but of course the state highway network was severely disrupted as well. And it was state highway one traffic now being diverted through the Lewis Pass, uh, which is an alpine pass not designed for the heavy vehicles that had to uh, traverse that route. In fact, in the year, uh, one year, one month, and one day that State Highway 1 was closed to the public, we had 130 injury crashes, about 25 to 30 serious crashes, and unfortunately seven fatalities on that route. Uh, there was estimated at the time to be about a million, $40 million per month cost 
to the New Zealand economy, and and that's such a big number that it's it's hard to imagine. But for me and many of the people that worked at Nectar, it was actually the community impact that we felt the most, and what really drove us to deliver. Um, we saw people out of their homes, like Renee's story, uh, they'd lost their livelihoods, they were isolated from um, other communities, and in fact the isolation of Kaikoura severely crippled their tourism industry, much like COVID has now, and 70 to 80 percent of all employment in Kaikoura is in some way, shape or form tied back to tourism, so you can imagine the, the devastating impact that had. Um, but not only was it impacting the community, it impacted the transport corridor. Uh, the road and the rail was damaged from Picton in the north to Waipapa in the south, and there was more than a million tonnes of material that had to be removed from just 10 slips north of Kaikoura alone. Uh, the Hope Fault even managed to rupture through one of the tunnels, uh, the rail tunnels in Half Moon Bay. And to, to get on top of this, an alliance was formed, the Nectar Alliance, and we were established in December 2016. And we're in alliance between Waka Kotahi and Kiwi Rail, and are supported by their construction partners Downer, Fulton Hogan, Hebb and Higgins. And there's also hundreds if not thousands of suppliers and professional services organisations um, further building up the, the Nectar Fana. So on, on to the second point now, some of the, the milestones and things that NECT has achieved over the last two and a half years, um, I'm not expecting you to read all of those, um, but this is a, a, a brief overview of some of the, the highlights of the milestones that we've achieved. And I kind of want to draw your attention to the orange boxes in the top left hand corner there. The first one is the magnitude 7.8 earthquake that got things rolling. Uh, but not happy with that, Mother Nature then decided that she'd throw us a few uh, cyclones in March and April 2017, and then ex-cyclone Gita came through and really kicked us um, when we thought we were doing a good job uh, in February 2018. Um, but for me personally, uh, my my the two that really stick with me is was achieving road opening in December 2017. That that'll be a day that'll last um, with me for the rest of my life. But also, uh, I think important in terms of earthquake recovery or disaster recovery in general was the, the transition that Nectar went through in the middle of 2018 into phase two, or what we called internally controlled delivery. And that was where we moved from the frantic um, work to, to get back level of service to thinking about um, getting more long term resilience in play and, and improving the corridor for the community. And, and for the users of that corridor as well. And obviously we had a few milestones we wanted to tick off uh, this year as we ran into Christmas 2020. Uh, COVID's uh, shaken that one up a little bit, but there will be an announcement next week on what our revised program is, so if you're interested, keep your eyes out for that. But to, to do those milestones, we obviously had to start with clearing the slips. There was a hell of a lot of material. The scale of damage is, is really hard to fathom. Uh, this is Orho Point that you can see there, and you'll see the little A's and B's. Um, so A is the top photo in the middle, and that's a 50 ton excavator that's trying to move that rock that is just as large. And B down the bottom there, that's actually at Orho Point, the point itself, enough 30 ton excavators that you may or may not actually be able to see in that photograph. So we attacked slip clearance from the air with sluicing, and from the ground with these significant earthworks um, operations that we were doing. And once, once we got the majority of the, the slip debris cleared away, we then went in with uh, rockfall protection. And that, that was to make it safe so that people could work on, on the corridor below uh, these rock faces or, or landslide or debris areas. And so we attacked it in a number of different ways, from active meshing up on the rock face to attenuators and drapes to rockfall fences, which you might be able to see down in the bottom right hand corner there, it's a bit faint, if I use this little arrow thing just down there, um, to rock fall buns, um, to retreating from the risk as we did um, around Orho Point and, and at other sites as well. Um, and where we couldn't address the rock fall risk, uh, we even extended tunnel portals like what you can see in the middle there, which is tunnel 19, the rail tunnel at Orho Point being extended. Um, Nectar, um, a bit of a shout out, also developed in-house a, a small modular rockfall protection wall and we had to develop this because we'd uh, constrained ourselves with a footprint of realigning the road and the rail. 
we had a rock pool risk we had to deal with. And so this small wall that you can see in the bottom left hand image uh, only has a footprint of two metres wide, but it, ha it can take a rock pool energy equivalent of about a ute travelling at roughly 85 kilometres an hour coming to an almost instantaneous stop. Um, so that was, that was kind of neat. When, when we were retreating from uh, the upslope hazards, we often employed seawalls uh, and in total we constructed about two and a half kilometres of seawall in this project uh, and they were towering you know, in excess of 10 metres above the foreshore level. And in simple terms, uh, they are mechanically stabilised earth walls, uh, so MSC walls with a robust concrete block facing that's, that's tied back into the MSC wall. Um, but the photo on the right there also has um, something that, that I'm quite proud of, not that I had much involvement with, but the safe stopping areas, which was another um, part of the improvements program that we introduced in phase two. And that's uh, going to leave quite a lasting legacy for the Kaikoura coastline, some amazing spots to stop at and, and view the, um, you know, it's a world class environment up there and so you get to stop and look at the seals at this particular one at Warho Stream. Um, so moving along, we also did a lot of bridge repairs. There were about 100 bridges, or more than 100 bridges actually, that needed assessing and roughly 69 that required either repair or, or replacement of some description. And I was talking with Steve, uh, the structures group lead, when pulling these slides together and we were discussing how do we speed up the recovery for bridges and, and his, his words, he said, they didn't do anything special. And that was the point. Um, they utilised standard designs or elements that were familiar to the construction industry and, and readily available across New Zealand. And that was that was a conscious decision not to, to get too crazy. Um, so this bridge in particular on the slide here is Kiwi Rail Bridge 129 at Tirahanga, and that's north of the Clarence River, um, well north of, of Kaikoura. And the old bridge unfortunately spanned a fault zone that deformed many metres vertically which meant it was not repairable and we had to replace it. Uh, we replaced it with a causeway embankment and a three span post tension precast sectional bridge. And um, talking with Steve again, this, this bridge was an example of where NECTA developed a standard design that could be rapidly rolled out by Kirirail on other projects or following the next disaster that, that they face. Um, but not just bridges, we also did retaining walls. And there were a, a huge amount of retaining walls across the network. Um, and we spent many days and months trying to find them and then uh, repairing them as well. So there's examples up on the screen there of sawnail walls and the Hundleys, and there were also plenty of them in the inland route. Uh, there was an anchored board pile wall constructed at Orho Point to support the railway line above the road. And then we also constructed some L-shaped retaining walls at site one or two, uh, 1A and 2, sorry. Now, I haven't touched on everything that Nectar did because I'd probably be here for an hour. Um, but there's things like tunnels that I haven't covered, debris flows and how we dealt with them, uh, the safety improvements that we did, which is probably more of a, a road safety focus. Um, but for me, in the community engagement stuff, is the construction of the village and the integration of our people back into the community to support the community in this time of recovery, which, which I think is an important aspect of resilience, um, which is my little segue into uh, resilience. And I'll ask that question again. After a major disaster, who cares about resilience? And you'll remember Renee's story that I, I started at the, at the start there. When faced with no home and no job, it's probably the last thing on your mind that you're thinking about. So it falls on us, the recovery organisations and the network owners, to be thinking about resilience before, during and after the, the major disasters. And so with, with the right focus, I, I truly believe that you know, we can still just get it open because I'm not sure if many of you remember reading the stuff articles uh, back in early 2017. There was you know, Tom, Dick and Harry in the paper saying that they could get in there with a bulldozer and open it quick as snap. So I think with the right planning beforehand, the right approach immediately after and the ongoing investment in um, transport, transport networks in this case, um, we can get that open um, much faster. And so there's this little diagram here and, and actually Brava, I believe, and, and a few others uh, presented this initial idea back in 2006. And, and that's the idea that, that 
resilience is the area of that triangle under the line there, and it's a function of the loss of service on uh, how far you go down on the vertical axis and the rate of recovery or the steepness of the slope to get your level of service back up. And so for us to try and improve the resilience, uh, to have greater resilience, we actually want to be reducing the size of that triangle, i.e. less of a drop in service and a faster recovery time. Um, and so I'd like to add to that a little bit if we can. And to do that, I think that we need to be looking to invest now to, to raise the bar. Um, I think Conrad said in his presentation that it was a, a four times benefit of investment in resilience before the event. Um, and so we can raise the bar now by either prevention, which is avoiding or mitigating the hazards at the, the early stages of design or implementation, um, or by preparation, which is understanding the vulnerability of our networks, uh, having a response plan in place, upgrading the critical weak points if we've got capital expenditure, or maintaining the network so it's actually functioning well if should a disaster hit. Um, and as as we saw north of Kaikoura, an outage of one slip or 85 slips, it doesn't really matter, can shut that corridor down and force a seven and a half hour detour via the Lewis Pass. The other element that we need to be doing is, is steepening the line. Um, and this is my subtle play at uh, flattening the curve to keep it relevant with COVID. But we, we need to be increasing um, the rate of recovery. And, and this was Nectar's primary focus. This, this was our thing. You know, program was number one for us. And to, to deliver on that promise of steepening the curve, uh, the line, sorry, we were aided by the alliance delivery model, the commercial model that we were working under, and also, quite importantly, the order and council that was passed. And they really enabled us to, to be quick and responsive. Uh, but from a design perspective, um, it's what Steve said earlier when talking about bridges, we kept it simple and we didn't do anything special. And, and that was so that people could get out there, be trained up on skills and Things could be constructed by unskilled labour where required. Um, but be warned, steepening the line can be expensive. Um, I'm not sure if I probably should go into costs, but in the in the days of before getting the road opening, we were burning 70 to 80 million and getting that road open a month. Um, and that's a huge amount of money to be spending. But you then think about the community impact of having that corridor isolated. 70 to 80 percent of Kaikoura's tourism uh, workers were tourism related and tourism was dead in that town until we got that road open. Um, so the, uh, the the last part of, of this triangle is building back better and, and that's something that the agency definitely already does and, and has done many times is you want to raise the bar for the next event that's going to come. So at Nectar that was things like the safety improvements that were brought in, the reliability works that we were doing with Kiri Rail, the addition of safe stopping areas with the amazing artwork package that was de uh, developed in partnership with Te Rurunanga or Kaikoura. Um, but for us in the design space, it's also about considering resilience in your design process. And this is something that we've talked a bit about over the years, um, both at Skirt with colleagues and in, in Nectar, is designing for failure. Um, and I like that because it's quite shocking. But during your design process, you need to be thinking about how the asset or system or, or whatever it is you're designing will respond in any large events and making sure that you're the one who's putting the fuse in the place that you want it to be, like a fuse in an electrical circuit. And we should look to control how, how the failure um, will manifest and so that we can then um, reinstate or repair quicker because we've made it fail in ways that we know we can get to and fix. And so Steve again tells me that in the bridges space, the modern construction approach of beams on bearers um, allowed them to repair elements of some modern bridges rather than having to go and replace the entire bridge is an, an example of that. Um, but an example that's closer to my heart is Oho Point. And this, this slip was the largest of the, the 10 slips north of Kaikoura, and it was right in the middle of the 10 slips of Kaikoura. So it was the hardest to get to, and it was the last one we got to. In fact, we only got construction access around the point four months before opening the road in August. And so I, I love this, this photo here, um, because it captures many of the things that Nectar did across the entire corridor. Um, 
if I add some annotations, there we go. So we've got you know, rock form meshing and scaling and bolting up the slope, uh, realigning the road and the rail to uh, avoid or retreat from the upslope hazards, building a seawall and an uplifted foreshore and some safety, uh, safe stopping areas as well. So um, now this here is a, is a, is a cross section of the typical seawall uh, profile at the south of Oho Point and the what you can see is the old pre-earthquake road up in the top left there which has now been utilised as a rockfall catch fence up at the top and we've got a rockfall fence in the middle of the, the scene there um, just in here which counts, it catches any of the bounces that make it over that rockfall bench up the top. And then down the bottom here, you've got the seawall with the MSC reinforcement in the back and State Highway 1 sitting on top. Um, now, as I said earlier, the seawall is an MSC wall with a robust concrete facing. And those concrete facings are five tonne blocks, two by one by one metres. And there's no steel reinforcing in them, but there is a GRP mesh on, on the front face. And they're tied back into the MSC uh, reinforced fill. Um, with geotech straps and a lot of the elements were simple to construct and so we, we could bring in unskilled labour uh, to do this and they could be trained up on how to, to build the the wall on site. Um, it didn't take long for them to get into the groove and they got very efficient at building these seawalls um, and in fact we, a lot of our suppliers came down and trained um, the, the men and women on the site how to, to lay out the geogrids as an example. Um, and it was the partnership with the suppliers that really made things go a lot faster, which was fantastic to see. Another thing we did here to, to help with the speed of the construction was we used um, cement stabilised aggregate as the fill in behind the seawall blocks there. Um, and this increased the stiffness of that mass considerably, but it also avoided um, any issues with compaction control, well it didn't avoid all issues, but it, it helped uh, mitigate uh, compaction control issues, especially when you're in a, um, a marine environment and you can get overtopping from storms that would erode um, or undo all the hard compaction effort that you've done. So we, another way we looked to speed up construction was the development of a no finds concrete backfill solution to the seawall option as well. Uh, this, this was hugely expensive as, as you could imagine, but the speed that we could construct that at was just otherworldly. Um, and that was how we managed to get from having uh, no access around the point to having a road that was five metres above the foreshore level um, at Oho Point in a space of just four months. Um, but for me, the real beauty of using an MSC wall um, for, for these road realignments around the, the large slips was the ability to open the road while the wall was only 30 to 40 percent, percent complete. As I said, we we're only up at about RL5 um, when we opened the road in Christmas 2017. And we would have struggled to have achieved such a thing with a bridge or a tunnel. Um, you'd either run off the end or straight into a... a <laughs> A wall. So I could carry on talking about um, you know sea walls and, and things for, for hours, but I'm, I want to circle back to sort of my main takeaway, which which is this this little diagram here. Um, there we go. And so the the key things as I see it that we should be doing to increase the resilience of a network or a system, and and that's raising the bar now and steepening the line and then building back be better. And so these three things will help reduce the error of that triangle as, as Barbara proposed in 2006 and increase the resilience of the, of the network or the system. And so to raise the bar, two things, we want to either prevent by avoiding the hazard or mitigation in the first place uh, or prepare which is by having an understanding of our, the vulnerability of our network or system and having a targeted response plan or upgrades to those critical weak elements or maintaining this and maintaining the system to ensure that it's operating efficiently when the disaster hits. And steepening the line is all about increasing the rate of recovery and shortening the time to get back to an acceptable level of, of service. And as I said earlier, this is what NECTA focused on. Program was our number one. But it can be expensive, um, but it has a massive potential, um, sorry, a massive positive benefit uh, to the affected communities. And so the other thing to note there is that previously I drew the steepening of the line as, as a, a linear line with a, a constant rate, um, but it's not. We had a 
much faster um, recovery effort prior to opening the road and once we were mixing with the public our rate of recovery if you speak um, slowed considerably as we had to dance around them and they had to dance around us on an, an active um, transport corridor. Um, but steepening the line requires a number of tough decisions to be made um, and often without full information and there will be consequences for the long term. And, and as an example of this, the agency now has the fun challenge of, of maintaining rockfall mesh that's 200 metres up a slope um, in a coastal environment and that was a conscious decision that was made to utilise that as a solution because it meant we got the road open much, much sooner um, than any other alternate option that we could have considered to, to either retreat further from that hazard or develop an alternate option. Um, and then the third element of, of this graph is the building back better phase. And this, this really helps raise the bar. You know, it's the start of the, the next event preparation. It raises the bar for the next disaster. Um, but if, if you take the opportunity, you can also have a positive impact on the local community which will be hurting after the disaster. Um, and also for us as designers, building back better means that we need to be considering the long-term resilience of whatever it is that we're designing, be it a system or a network or, or an element in an asset. Um, we need to be designing for failure. We need to consider how that system will fail, control the failure mechanism where we can um, to enable faster reinstatement uh, next time when the next disaster happens. So who cares about resilience? Well I think we all should care about resilience and if, if done well um, throughout the life cycle of, of an asset or a network um, we'll be able to bounce back quicker and better from, from the next big disaster that hits us. Uh, and for those of you that are, that are curious about Renee and how she's going, uh, she joined us in Nectar in 2017 and still works for us today. Um, so it's, she's all right. Uh, but I'd also like to thank, uh, extend my thanks to Steve Proctor um, for his support and mentorship over the last three years and, and help pulling this together. So Barbara, I believe you're going to facilitate the Q&A discussion now. Um, and thanks everyone for listening. Kia ora. Hello, uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Let's now go to the question and answer session. And uh, so you, you can see on the screen the questions with questions which have come up from uh, Pigeon Hall. So I'd like to sort of thank uh, thank the presenters uh, for your for your excellent uh, presentation. We'll start with uh, the first question. Uh, so it's for Conrad. So uh, Dr. Zorn, have mudslides been considered using the Ely Montana model? Uh, thanks, Baba. Uh, so I'm not familiar with this particular uh, model itself, but if I can rephrase the question slightly into uh, landslides, for example. Um, landslides are a difficult one and an ongoing issue. Um, so fire can probably be put in the same uh, same category. So these kinds of hazards, landslides and fire, are typically uh, scenarios or susceptibility that you model. Um, so not a not a probabilistic hazard like you would get with a, a flood map. You know, you'd have a one in a hundred year flood map or a, a two, four, seven, five year return period earthquake map, something like that. Um, so these are more based on susceptibility. Uh, landslides obviously heavily dependent on, on topography. Um, so it's difficult to include these into, um, into the probability loss curves and things like that if you don't actually have a, uh, a rate of occurrence um, for these. I'm sure there are geotechnical engineers in the call here that could put a, um, a probability on a specific, uh, specific landslide and a specific slope. Um, but nationally or, uh, or globally, it's very difficult, particularly when you've got saturation and, and shaking and things like that. And the, uh, the leading modelers of, of these uh, hazards around the world all, all adopt uh, this kind of same viewpoint. These are, these are some of the difficult ones. Thanks, though. Thanks, Conrad. Right, I'll, I'll, we'll go to the next one, and the screen chips it around, so it's nice and easy. So we'll go to the top one. 
on the list there. So, uh, question for Rolly. So, really like your mention of building back better. Was the idea of increased resilience betterment during recovery a hard sell to uh, entity and government, or was this readily supported? Um, the so we had two um, owners at Nectar. So it was Kiru Rao and the agency, and they have different. Um, backgrounds I suppose and so for the agency in particular they were fully supportive of increasing resilience um, or, or betterment if you want to use that word but, but building back better was, was something that the agency um, I believe it's probably 2016 have, have been readily pushing um, for that after disasters as well and the government um, oh what is it the statement um, Actually, actually requires a greater level of investment in resilience anyway. So that that wasn't a hard sell. Kiruel, it was a little bit different, um, as they had, were fun, being partially funded by insurance, um, and so that that was a, a slightly different approach, and that was um, reinstated in, in accordance with their insurance requirements. Okay, thanks, uh, David. Uh, so we'll go to the next. Uh, question. So, does the cost benefit ratio consider the upfront cost of investing in infrastructure versus the delayed cost of an event over the design life of the structure uh, over the event considered? The first time this is for uh, uh, Conrad. The cost benefit ratio. Um, yeah, so for a bit of clarity, so this, this $4 benefit. Uh, Every additional dollar spent is was more focused on the on the low and middle income countries, which is where we do a lot of this uh, this analysis. Um, the cost of inaction, though, is a uh, important concept, though, and it's a significant increasing rapidly um, as you as you delay your decisions. Uh, with climate change, in particular, it uh, accelerates even more so. About uh, about doubles um, the, the net benefits of resilience. If you're including uh, climate effects in it as it hasn't, so in the low and uh, middle-income countries, it's about about a trillion dollars is the, the median cost of action that can, uh, can stack up over the life of, of the assets they're currently doing. Uh, built there. I can. What I might do is I'll just drop a, a link to the report where this comes from. So this was a report out from uh, the World Bank last year that a number of us around the world were asked to contribute to. In, in various capacities and across various infrastructure sectors. Um, and then it's got tons of information there. It's called Lifelines suitably as well, the Resilient Infrastructure Opportunity. So um, give that to you for some fair time reading. Apologies, it's a, quite a long, long one though. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Conrad. All right, we'll shift to a question to um, Kaylee. So the top question for Kaylee there. Uh, are we considering potential variability of the fill and filters during construction of the dams? Often these can contribute to failure. Question mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are a couple of elements there, both in terms of the actual gradings that you find when you go through construction records. I mean, that's that's one source of um, information. The harder thing to quantify is probably the potential for segregation um, and variability induced not just due to a wide grading but due to the way the materials are placed um, and compacted and particularly with glacial materials, um, the potential for that. So there are many considerations before we select one gradation to put into a test device and there are different ways around that. Um, gone so far as to try and do reliability analyses using OpenSeas to statistically assess um, what things look like. More pragmatically, it kind of is that question of can we get um, good gradation data to look at the shape of the curve, to look at the width of that gradation envelope, and try and work out whether um, construction gradations are actually what is in the dam at present, which is often the challenge. So yeah, they absolutely can, and there's a, a bit of a dark art to trying to approach that problem. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Kelly. So we'll go to the next question. Uh, 
for Conrad. Uh, how can the various UCC authorities collaborate to deal with the resilience and cascade effects in an integrated manner? Uh, right, so yeah, the the local owner operators of, of infrastructure networks are already doing a, a pretty good job in, in terms of the global scene um, and really good across New Zealand um, in terms of trying to integrate uh, and collaborate across these um, the, the Lifelines Agency, so the National Lifelines Committee um, that you may be familiar with, and, and the regional ones as well. The regional forums already meet uh, repeatedly, they're all um, well integrated to each other. And you often read um, in not only in New Zealand reports, um, for example, the, the Civil Defence Review of the Canterbury Recovery, but also global reports um, from different development banks and NGOs talking about about Christchurch recovery and how it was these connections that are already made um, between engineers of different companies and, and willingness to work together um, and being able to pick up the phone and already know who you're going to talk to and who you need to ring to get things done is a, uh, is a really uh, high point and which really helped the, the Christchurch um, recovery uh, to address some link there. In terms of what they, they can keep doing, um, sharing data and skills with each other. It's a, it's a costly exercise though, is the problem. Um, but having data sets in a, in a really valuable format that you can share with each other, share with the civil defence controllers, um, other researchers and bits and pieces like that is a, is a good stepping stone and a, and a relatively uh, quick win. It means you don't have to do all the work yourself. And others can also um, uh, leverage off of your knowledge and bits and pieces too. hope that answers uh, your questions. Uh, we'll go to David. So David, linking to your little your sketch that you presented, your comment on the economic be benefit of steepening the line, was that in your mind at, at the time of the NECDA work? Yeah, um, for us, uh, we probably wouldn't have used the phrase of steepening the line um, back then, but for us, getting the road and rail open was the mantra. Um, we would often be in decision making workshops and the question that was always asked was will this get the road open faster? Um, that was the one driving thing um, that that entire organisation um, rallied around was, was quite literally moving mountains to reconnect communities. Um, so yeah, right from the start. Yeah, thanks very much. So oh, let's go to the next question. Uh, it's again, uh, so I'll, maybe I'll go to your question. Uh, so, uh, are we considering, are we considering, uh, uh, are we considering potential real? Uh, yeah, the answer there. Uh, for the dam database, is there a metadata review of the performance and risk versus uh, construction of the dam? Um, we have generated um, kind of some metadata review for the overall inventory. Um, we're in a bit of a position at the moment with the forthcoming regulatory dam safety scheme where the councils who contributed data are a little bit shy about um, making the data publicly available due to the fact that it will need to be updated um, for a regulatory framework so that they're not putting a heap of effort into data quality at the moment. Um, we definitely have a pretty good understanding of dam size and reported potential impact classification for dams that have that data available and that was one of the big tools looking at a regulatory framework saying if we select a height and volume criterion, criteria, combined criteria, um, are we capturing all of our high potential impact dams or are we, um, are we missing some of them? So one interesting thing was that in 2015, um, the, there was a dam safety regulation that uh, was almost brought into effect and then revoked three weeks prior to it coming into effect. And when we actually looked at the inventory and considered the combined height and volume thresholds for inclusion in that scheme, those thresholds were not capturing 
some high potential impact dam in New Zealand. And so high potential impact dam, for those of you that don't know, uh, would potentially kill two or more people if they failed. So actually having a database, um, being able to run different thresholds through that database and looking at what we're capturing and what we're not with different height and volume thresholds is really important. Um, I'm hoping that in the future we'll publish a bit more kind of unidentifiable data um, on the characteristics of dams in New Zealand. Really? Uh, we'll shift back to Rolly. So for, for the nectar work, did one wall type prove more appropriate for a disaster rebuild scenario, i.e. gaining economies of scale by using one method more than others, or was it all specific to each situation? Um, yes and no. Uh, so the the yes part of that is we had one, or well we had ended up with two seawall designs, um, and that was deliberate. We only really wanted one, um, but we, we saw an opportunity to get faster um, construction speeds with the inclusion of the no fines concrete solution. Um, and then that was the initial three seawalls that were designed were all similar. Uh, we then, as part of the improvements package, uh, a fourth seawall was brought into scope in Half Moon Bay there, and that, that was a revised design that was largely similar to the, the first design that was produced, um, so that the crews could, they provided their feedback on how the design could be improved to increase construction, uh, ease of construction. So in the seawall space, yep, we tried to, to keep it same, same. Uh, in the retaining wall space, um, it was, uh, there were standard designs, especially through the Hundleys and the inland route, that were designed and then tailored to each site specifically. Um, and that was again, yeah, economies of scale, but also um, it's not just the economies of scale, it's, it's your workforce. We, we drew such a large workforce into this project that not everyone actually knew how to build a sawnail wall when they turned up on site to build a sawnail wall. So you have to think about um, repeatable activities that subcontractors can do over and over so they can actually become proficient at them um, so that you can use, draw on more um, people to be um, put to work on the project basically. So yeah, there was a lot of um, similar designs built, but as with everything, they do have to be tailored to each site specifically. Thanks, David. Uh, so we'll go uh, to a question for Kerry. Um, the smart uh, new track seal equipment you have been developing, is that going to be available uh, to get testing done by the industry? Yeah, I mean, that is the long term intent was to get the device here. Um, there'll be quite a large apprenticeship required to get kind of even membrane compliance. Huge, a huge issue at that scale. Um, in the medium term, the priority will obviously be the hydropower partners and their structures and their priorities, um, and we have a program lined up for that when commissioning and verification is complete. But the ultimate goal here, and the reason that the Civil and Natural Resource Department at the University of Canterbury um, provided partial funding, um, a, a minor amount of funding, it's the intent that this device really should be contributing to um, New Zealand's geotechnical research in the long term. The applications beyond um, dam engineering are obviously for liquefaction of gravelly soils. We, we've got a lot of work as a collective geotechnical community to do to understand liquefaction of gravels, and there is interest uh, here at Canterbury in using the device for that. Um, but with the hydropower partners uh, fronting up for about two thirds of the overall cost, um, and we're talking many hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, they will be the priority for the, for the time being. In saying that, there are a lot of other tests that need to be done before we're confident in putting that one gradation of material into this device. And so in conversations with people, you know, oh, people often say, oh, can we, can we get the hands on the device? And it's kind of like, well, you know, what, what prior testing have you done? What do you know about soil? Have you done characterization, why do you want to test a particular gradation, and in many cases we can actually answer the questions that need to be answered not using that device. So more than happy to talk to people about what their needs are, and you know, perhaps using a rigid wall device if we're looking at seepage flow, um, there are potentially other ways to, to answer questions. Thanks.
Great. I think that's that's all the questions, Jeff. So thanks to the presenters for, for all those excellent presentations and answers, and I'll um, pass it over to Jeff to wrap things up. Yeah, I'd like to add my, my thanks to Liam um, and Brava for chairing, obviously to Conrad, Kaylee, and Rolly for the three great presentations, uh, and also to Matt Fox for his organisation efforts uh, that went into today. So just a reminder, the next webinar will be June 25th, it's two weeks from today, uh, Thursday, June 25th, uh, same midday start that we've been had throughout the, the webinar series, and uh, we have David Ma from Mass Structural Design in California, and then we'll also have Alistair Cadnack and Ron Bella from Dunning Thornton. Uh, this will be a low damage seismic design. And the formal announcement will be coming out early next week with the opportunity to register. So thank you everyone for attending. And we will um, wrap it up there and look forward to welcoming you all back again in another two weeks. <laughs>